climate change is the biggest challenge that we face as humanity. It's an existential threat. And yet, we don't seem to be responding fast enough to it. And I believe that the way we design our built environment contributes to it. We've isolated ourselves from the climate. Therefore, we don't see what's happening to the climate on a day-to-day -day basis. And we care less about it. We've developed what I call climate apathy. A recent article in the New York Times titled How Air Conditioning Conquered North America, Even the Pacific Northwest, kind of brought this home for me. And as an architect, I'm the director of sustainability at Olson Kundig, a global design firm headquartered in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle. This really hit home. And I've seen it firsthand where it is hard to convince developers to invest in things like operable windows or building shades because it's not seen as providing enough value. And as air conditioning systems get more efficient and renewable systems like solar panels get cheaper, there actually isn't that much of an energy penalty for leaving them out. So in this context, I ask myself, what is the role of passive buildings in today's world? So what, are passive, what is passive design? In, in architecture, passive buildings are when you build your building, design your building, to work with the environment, so to embrace the climate, to use the climate. So you might use natural ventilation in the summertime to cool the building. You might use building shades to block the sun when you need it, or open it up when you don't need it. And it's something that I have spent the better part of my career studying, advocating for, and really working towards, designing towards. Now, passive design gained popularity in the US in the 1960s during the first energy crisis. But it can trace its roots far, far beyond that. Before the advent of air conditioning or even electricity, People had to rely on the climate, on working with the climate, respite from the climate. As a result, you had these architectural expressions from around the world that were rich, that were derived from their climate, and that didn't look alike. A building in Iran would look very different from a Swiss chalet. Today, I find that all of our buildings look the same, no matter where they are, and I think that's a pity. So what is the promise of air conditioning? Well, air conditioning promises control and uniformity. But one thing it cannot promise is universal thermal comfort. And the reason for that is thermal comfort actually consists of six factors. So there's air temperature that we're familiar with. There's also radiant temperature, which is the temperature of the surfaces around you. So you might be sitting next to a window and the sun might be hitting you and you'll feel hot. Or the same window in the wintertime, you might feel cold. Radiation has a huge part in your ultimate thermal comfort, as does airflow. So the more air you move across your body, the cooler you feel. And then humidity. Humidity has a big part. And then there's two other factors. There's activity. Yeah, if you've been for a run, you're going to feel hotter than if you've been sitting at your desk. And then your clothing. Clothing has a huge part to play in your ultimate thermal comfort. Now, air conditioning systems run off a thermostat that's on your wall that is, sorry, that's based on only air temperature. So it's controlling with only one out of six factors. So it's no wonder that the biggest complaint in buildings today is that people are uncomfortable. And contrary to what you might think, they're actually too hot in the wintertime and too cold in the summer. Now, compare that with passive systems where you might actually have multiple factors, so four factors from the building and then two factors from the people. You're addressing multiple factors to gain thermal comfort. So you might have shades that block the sun in the summer and reduce that radiation, make you more comfortable, or let the sun in in the wintertime and raise that radiation level and store it maybe in thermal mass. 
um, you might have operable windows that let in the bree breezes to increase that airflow to help you feel cooler. Now, what's interesting is all of these put the human at the center, Sarah Humano. And the best thermostat for you is you. So it's interesting that passive buildings actually lead to active users, users who are more connected to their environment, who are more aware of their environment and more mindful. So what is thermal comfort then? It's an interesting definition. So thermal comfort is defined as the lack of discomfort, which is a weird way to define anything, right? What it's not, so thermal comfort does not promise delight. It does not promise joy. It just promises lack of discomfort. So it's no wonder then that our buildings, as we design them today, lack soul, they lack joy, the thermal environments. Now, the variability that comes with passive systems is seen as a negative, but it has two very important benefits. And the first one is it's actually good for you. So a 2012 study at the National Institute of Health found a link between obesity rates in developed countries and the prevalence of air conditioning. Think about that for a second. That's pretty powerful. So what happens when we get uncomfortable? Well, when we are a little bit warm, we perspire and we flush, right? Our blood moves to our extremities. When we're cold, our metabolic rate goes up. All of these things that we think of as inconveniences are actually our cardiovascular system working for us, keeping us healthier, and we've lost that. The other important factor is that variation from passive systems lays the groundwork for thermal delight. So what is thermal delight? I want you to close your eyes for a minute, and I'm going to tell you when to open them. So imagine you're in a desert. The hot sun is baking down on you. There's this hot, arid breeze that's blowing across you. You feel desiccated. You feel exhausted. You feel tired. And you come up on this oasis. In the middle of the oasis is this beautiful building with a courtyard at the center. And it's a shaded courtyard. And as you enter it, you can smell the smell of these aromatic trees. Maybe it's jasmine. And there's this beautiful fountain at the center of the courtyard. And as you enter the courtyard, you're greeted with this cool breeze. It's refreshing. It's rejuvenating. You feel this sense of euphoria, of joy. Open your eyes. That is thermal delight. When you move from discomfort to comfort, the joy that you feel. And it's predicated on two things. The first one is an initial discomfort. The second one is thermal variability. Now, if we entered that courtyard from an air-conditioned office building, you would likely feel very little. Now, it's important that these aspects of thermal delight and variation actually serve a social function. They bring people together. In New York in the 1940s, before air conditioning, people used to sit on the stoops in the evening, and they used to talk to each other. And they knew their neighbors. They were socially well-knit because it was cooler outside, right? It was bringing them together. Nowadays, you find we've actually moved away from that. We've actually ceded that common area to no man's land to our detriment. And you see examples of this from around the world. Front porches. This is actually my family, my childhood porch. That's me over there. There were just three steps over there. But those steps were more monumental to me than any Greek temple. And that's because it was a place that our family gathered. Very important. Tents around a campfire where people huddled together for warmth or in a house, in a fireplace, where people gather around a central hearth. All of these things bring people together. Marketplaces where people come in warm countries to get out of the sun, but also to experience these sensory delights, smells, sounds, tastes. And sensory input is so important for space. Now, when it comes to sensory space, 
there's this idea that we have five senses. Each of them has a scale associated with them. So we can see furthest, and then we can hear, and then we can smell, and then touch and taste. Now, a sense of vision being the largest gives us the most information, right? And we tend to lead with what we see, especially as designers. We, we are so visual. What's interesting is that those more intimate senses are tied to a sense of emotion and memory, senses like taste and sound and smell and touch. So I come from a very large, well-knit family. And a lot of our common memory is around food. You know, the tastes, the aromas, the textures, it's amazing. And festival time was this, it was this incredible sensory experience with my grandmother at the center of it all, the smell of jasmine, and then these sweet dishes that she'd make, you know, laced with ghee and cardamom and jaggery and, you know, the tangy sweetness of raisins. All of these things, these memories, kind of are inextricably tied to my sense of emotion and memory and root me in who I am. Now, what does this have to do with buildings? Well, when buildings are designed well, they can actually tie you to your place. They can be a sensory experience that connects you to where you are. So Olsen Kundig's Seattle office is located in a 120-year-old brick building in historic Pioneer Square. And it used to be a shoe factory with three large skylights on the roof. During the Second World War, those roofs were boarded over because they present easy targets for bombers coming across the water. When we took over the office, a decision was made to open up one of the skylights and open it up as only Olsen Kunde can. Kinetically, it's an engineering marvel. That skylight actually opens on city water pressure. So there's two pistons that fill with water. And then when we lower it, it gets released into that planting trough over there. But then the skylight brings in cool air, it lets out warm air, it turns off the air conditioning system, and it brings daylight in. It is one of the most beloved features in our office. It's the first thing we take people on a tour to. And when I first joined Olsen Kunde, my desk was under the skylight. And every time that skylight opened, I was treated to this sensory experience. It was incredible, still is. The first thing you notice when the skylight is open is silence. It's incredible. It's the shutting off the, of the air conditioning system and that white noise that's been in your ears disappears. It's like stepping off an airplane. And that opens up your ears to other sounds. The sound of the seagull on the roof, telling you that you're a thousand feet from the water, right? You hear the sound of the tram going by. Ding, 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 ding. It tells you, hey, I'm in a city with trams. That's pretty cool. And then you can hear conversations from the street, people talking. All of these connect you back to your neighborhood and where you are. And then that skylight opens, and you feel this cool breeze. And it's delicious. It's refreshing. It's got a little bit of humidity to it. It might give you goosebumps. And then you can, you can smell the ocean in it. And then if you can close your eyes, you can taste it. You can taste the salt. And all of these things tie you to your place and to your climate. And that's the point. Look, I'm not arguing against air conditioning. I think air conditioning is really necessary, especially as our planet warms. But climate change is the biggest challenge we face. And climate apathy will be our downfall. But it doesn't have to be. We currently design buildings to be climate rejecting, to isolate ourselves from the climate only in an emergency when the power goes out. But what if we reverse that? What if we designed our buildings to actually be climate embracing, to be passive first, and then use air conditioning in an emergency when it gets too hot or too cold? Well, then we'd have buildings that embraced the climate, that were a delight for the senses, that brought joy, that made you connected to where you are, that made you care about your place and about your climate, and about your climate. And as you 
start to embrace your climate, maybe you'd be moved to save it. To move from climate apathy to climate empathy. Thank you. Muchas gracias. <laughs>